Well, before I jump into my talk, on behalf of the University of Oregon cohorts, we would like to step up in defense of Steve's honor and say that the G Matrix looks like the Perfecto cigar. So um, <laughs> in the future, you just have to list what kind of cigar you're using when you're talking about your G Matrix. Um, but my connection with Steve is not through doing G matrices. It's actually through thinking about sexual selection and sexual conflict. Um, and I first met Steve um, as part of my dissertation advisory committee. Um, and it was such a thrill um, getting to have his input on my work because the name Arnold was one that I came across a lot when I first started getting into sexual selection. Um, and he really influenced the way I thought about the world. Um, and uh, I can attribute partially me going to Toronto to Steve as well. So big impact on my career already. Um, but one paper that's really stuck with me is the Arnold and Wade on the measurement of natural and sexual selection. Um, and the really, reason I really like this paper is because it gives us this nice comprehensive framework for linking biology to the life cycle of an organism and thinking about the different phases and how selection is acting in those phases. And so I want to walk you first through how I like to think about a life cycle, and then we're going to relate this to the experiment that I've designed to try to understand the importance of post-insemination comp competitive dynamics. So to orient ourselves here, all individuals start as a fertilization event, and then they have to survive and grow to the point where they can become a reproductive adult. And here is where things get tricky, because in sexually reproducing organisms, reproduction requires gametes from both sexes. And so when we think about a life cycle, we really should be thinking about these interlocking life cycles of a male and a female that come together at these critical points of mating and at fertilization. So with this in mind, we can now start to partition our life cycle into phases and thinking about how selection is acting at these phases. And in particular, I want to do this in a sex-specific manner so we can create, relate this to sex-specific selection and how that creates antagonism or conflict between the sexes. So again, first we're going to have our survival resource allocation phase where natural selection is acting on an organism. And here, if the fitnesses between females and males are different, then we can get sexual antagonism as a result of genetic pleiotropies um, because the sexes are sharing a genome. And then we're going to move into our reproductive phase. And I'm going to break this into two kind of steps. So first, we have pre-insemination mating interactions. Here, sexual selection is acting. This is necessarily sex-specific. And this is going to lead to a successful copulation event. And now we get to move into the wonderful world of post-insemination dynamics. So here we have gametic interactions, things like sperm competition, sperm um, egg um, interactions, as well as um, interactions with the female reproductive tract. And this has kind of been a black box up until now, especially in internally fertilizing organisms. This is a really hard area to study. Um, but these gametic processes are thought to be very important, and they're going to modulate whether that successful mating is turned into a successful fertilization. So this represents a single generation, a discrete life cycle, but we know that that's not how all organisms survive, so we can add some connectivity into our life cycle, in particular by relating mating back either into the survival phase or individuals can go directly back into mating again. So I like using this type of framework because now we can start to think about um, making comparisons and hypothesis testing between, say, the sexes at different phases or looking at um, the sexes uh, um, between, say, pre-insemination and post-insemination phases. So this life cycle framework lets us compare the action of selection um, in this hypothesis testing framework. And what I want to focus on here is this relationship between pre-insemination and post-insemination competitive success. And so if we think about this from a perspective of a male, a male's total reproductive success is going to be modulated by how much sperm that male can make, how many mates it can, can successfully copulate with, and then how many of those copulations get translated into a successful fertilization. So that male has to be able to convince a female to mate with him, and then 
that sperm, in the case of sperm competition, has to outcompete any other sperm there. And we don't have a good idea of kind of the balance or the relationship between these two phases in terms of which one is more important for a male winning a fertilization. So we can imagine a scenario where these two phases are equally important. So here these three different males are mating with an equal frequency to this female, and therefore they're producing offspring in an equal frequency. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between how successfully that male mates and how those are turned into fertilizations. Alternatively, we can imagine a scenario where pre-insemination is more important. So now the male that mates the most wins all of the fertilizations. And on the other end of this continuum, we can imagine that post-insemination is more important. So it doesn't matter how much a male mates, as long as some of that sperm gets in there, it can out-compete any other sperm and win all of those fertilization events. So if we want to understand kind of where on a continuum an organism is, we need to be able to tease apart pre-insemination success from post-insemination success. And this has been really hard because isolating sperm competitive ability has been really challenging up until now. So I'm going to introduce you to our hero of the day, and that is Cenorhabditis nematodes. So why use worms as a model for studying sexual selection and sexual conflict? Well, they're small, they're easy to culture, and they have a short generation time, all of which makes them really great for experimental evolution. We also have the ability to cryopreserve and then resuscitate them, which is another cool trick when you're doing experimental evolution. And there's a wealth of genomic information and genetic tools available to us, such as genome editing using CRISPR-Cas9, that can allow us to do some really fun tricks that are hard in other systems. Some other things that make worms great is that there are multiple mating systems present within the Cenorhabditis genus. And this is created by three independent lineage transitions to self-fertilizing hermaphrodism. And this gives us natural variation in the strength of sexual selection across Cenorhabditis. We also have the ability to manipulate mating system. For example, in C. elegans, we can feminize hermaphrodites to make them functionally female. Um, and then we can test a hermaphrodite versus this kind of new female state. And finally, worms have really cool sperm. And it's characterized by this unique crawling sperm morphology. And this is a trait that's unique to and conserved across the phylum nematoda. And this just allows us to look at sperm competition and other um, kind of gametic selective processes from a different perspective. So with all of this in mind, Moving forward as part of my PhD, I wanted to know if I could actually manipulate post-insemination dynamics within Cenorhabditis nematodes and use this to try to understand the importance of sperm competitive success in the overall reproductive success of a male. And this is a massive project, so I want to make sure that I'm thanking everyone that helped me. So Megan was a technician in the Phillips lab who helped with all of the transgenics. Christine is a technician in the Phillips lab, as well as these three fantastic undergrads, Ruben, Alex, and Brennan, and they help me keep track of tens of thousands of worms for about eight months, um, so really helpful. All right, what do I mean when I say sperm competitive dynamics in a worm? Well, let me introduce you to a female. Here is her nose, and here is her tail, and her vulva is in the middle. And if we zoom in on the left arm of the gonad, we can see the oviduct, where immature oocytes are then released, and they go through the spermatheca, where sperm are stored, they are fertilized, and move into the uterus, where they develop for a number of hours before they're laid out the vulva. So if a female or a feminized hermaphrodite mates with a single male or a single genotype of male, then all of that sperm is going to be the same. In this case, we have all green sperm. Now if we add in a competitor, we can get sperm competition. So now green sperm and purple sperm have to compete against each other for access to oocytes as well as for winning fertilization events. And let's say there's some selective pressure for green sperm to outcompete purple sperm. Over time, we might see responses, things like a larger sperm size giving a sperm competitive advantage, or perhaps better positioning in the spermatheca for access to those oocytes. And all of these phenotypic changes will have uh, genetic changes underlying them that have to do with the genetic basis of the sperm competitive ability or this post-insemination success. 
So this is the basic idea behind the experimental evolution that we're doing. We're selecting for males to have an increased sperm competitive ability over time. So let's walk through this design together. So on day one, females and males mate with each other. And so our little conjectogram of what's happening within the spermatheca is that all of our sperm is coming from the same gene type of male. And now we want to isolate this sperm so we can add in our competitive pressure. And to do this, we're going to use an inducible sterility system. So briefly, how this works is we're using the auxin inducible degradation system. So we have a degron tag on the critical spermatogenesis gene, B44. And we're going to drive expression of this F-box protein tier 1. So when there's no auxin hormone present, tier 1 is inactive, so that SP44 has normal activity, which means there's normal spermatogenesis, normal mating, and sperm transfer. To induce sterility, we transfer the worms onto auxin-containing media. And now that tier 1 becomes active and it's going to target the degron tag on our spermatogenesis gene for ubiquitation. So we're going to break down this critical spermatogenesis gene that's going to arrest uh, spermatogenesis from happening. So now males can mate normally, but there's no sperm they can transfer. So in this way, we can induce sterility within our males. So now we've created this snapshot in time where we've captured all the sperm that was originally transferred and we add in our competitors. So now, the sperm that we're interested in, this green sperm, has to outcompete all this incoming purple sperm for winning fertilizations. So in this way, we're selecting for sperm defensive capability as well as sperm longevity. After a 24-hour competitive window, we want to propagate our line to the next generation, but we only want to propagate those progeny that are coming from this initial mating. So progeny coming from green sperm. And to do this, we have an inducible lethality marker in our competitor. So by heat shocking, we can drive expression of the toxic protein peel one. And this causes muscle and epidermal breakdown and eventual death within our competitor cross progeny. And this leaves us with only progeny coming from this initial mating that we're interested in to start the next generation. And again, in this way, we're selecting for sperm defensive capability as well as sperm longevity. Now, to do this experiment required two genetic tricks. This lethality had been shown before, but designing a sterility induction system was actually quite challenging. It's something I'm very proud of. So I just want to show you one um, set of time series data for how this works. So we're looking at developmental stage on the x-axis. You can look at it in hours or in larval stage one, skipping to day one adult, day two adult. Blue is showing you where spermatogenesis is happening. And if these worms are raised on normal media throughout <coughs> larval development, they'll be fully fertile. But if you transition them to auxin-containing media at day one of adulthood, all males are fully sterile within 24 hours. What I'm not showing you is if you take these sterile males off of auxin, then you, they will regain their full fertility. So this is the first external, inducible, non-toxic, reversible sterility system in an animal. And so we're very proud of this. This is a very cool trick. All right, if you think about this design, there are really two treatments that we have. We have sterility induction and competition. So we can do this as a full factorial design. So if there's no sterility and no competition, we have a lab adaptation control. If we only induce sterility, then we're controlling for those sterility effects as well as kind of competition within our evolving population. If we have no sterility induction but we add competitors, we now get the full suite of pre- and post-insemination competitive dynamics as well as sperm offensive and defensive behaviors. And finally, we have this sterility induction and competition line that we talked about together. So each of these treatment combinations represents a line. Lines were maintained at a population size of 5,000 worms. Together, four lines formed a single replicate, and I ran six replicate populations. And these all came from the same ancestral stock that went through five generations of mutagenesis to create genetic variation, followed by 15 generations of lab adaptation in population sizes in the tens of thousands. And I want to point out we're doing all of this in C. elegans that's been feminized. So that, again, means that these are functionally female hermaphrodites that require males to mate. And males are maintained at a sex ratio of one to one. Okay, so this ran for 10 selective generations, 30 generations total. 
And the output that I'm gonna be showing you today is how sperm competitive ability has improved over time, and showing that as a function of how total reproductive success changes. So we're gonna be looking at a lot of sperm competition assay data. So let's walk through kind of how these assays are set up. So females, population of females, are mated with a population of our males of interest, plus competitors. And competitors are added at a one-to-one -one ratio of the males that we're interested in. And in this case, if sterility is not induced in these um, males of interest, then we're going to be measuring the total reproductive success of those males. So let's see where our ancestor started at for this assay. So looking at total reproductive success of our ancestor. On the y-axis, I'm showing you the proportion of progeny coming from the ancestor. Each dot represents a biological replicate, and the mean and standard error are shown by the diamond and bar. So you can see that the total reproductive success of our ancestral male is around 45%. So these males aren't fantastic, but they're not too terrible either. So now let's look at how much of this can be um, thought of as coming from sperm competition. So what's the sperm competitive ability of our ancestor? So we're gonna do this same type of assay, except for here we induce sterility of our males. So again, the males of interest would mate with our females for 24 hours, sterility would be induced, and competitors would come in for 24 hours. So our sperm competitive success now is really terrible. So we have about 4% of progeny that's coming from ancestor under this competition assay. So the sperm are not very good in our ancestor, so we would hope we can see a strong response to selection. So let's see if that's what we find. So we're first gonna focus on this sterility and competition line. And these worms, while they were evolving, saw competitors at a two evolving male per one competitive male ratio. So this is a moderate selective pressure over these 10 selective events. And then they get challenged in these bio sperm competition assays with that one to one ratio again. Okay, so we're looking at time by selective event on the X axis and proportion of selected male on the Y axis. The dash lines are showing you the six independent biological replicates and then the mean and standard error across replicates is plotted, as well as the overall trend line. And we can see that despite there being quite a bit of noise um, within these assays, there is an increase in sperm competitive ability over time, going from around 4% in ancestor to close to 30% within our evolved males. So, Yay, we actually think we're selecting on sperm competition and we actually did select on sperm competition. We saw quite a strong response over a very short period of time. So we did this in a factorial design so we could tease apart pre-insemination and post-insemination. So I'm gonna walk through all of these graphs with you now um, and we'll see how well uh, sperm competition does relative to total increase in reproductive success. So first, focusing on total reproductive success, looking across our lines on the x-axis, and the increase in total reproductive success as a percent on the y normalized by the ancestor. So this means a value of zero is no improvement over time relative to the ancestor. And any positive value means the percent increase in reproductive success relative to ancestor. So if we first just look at our control, each of these points is representing the mean value for each of the six biological replicates. And again, I'm showing the mean and the standard error, though in this case it's very tight, so you don't see it. Um, but you can see that even in our controls, we have quite a strong increase in total reproductive success. And if we compare this now across all of our lines, so sterility control, our sterility and competition evolved, and our competition evolved lines, we can see that all have increased in the total reproductive success of these males. Though there seems to be quite a bit of variance in some of these lines. So now that we see our total reproductive success, let's partition out what came from an increase in sperm competitive ability. So I'm gonna show you this as looking at the proportional change of sperm competitive ability over total reproductive success. So here a value of zero would suggest that all of that reproductive success is coming from an increase in pre-insemination ability, 
whereas a value of 100 or 100 percent says that all of that um, reproductive success increase is coming from a sperm competitive ability. So here's where our ancestor sits, and here's where all of our lines are. So across all of our lines, we actually surprisingly see around the same increase in sperm competitive ability, which is not what I would have expected going into this, but it's quite interesting. So in all cases here, we can see the mean is around 25 to 35% of a male's reproductive success here is due to increased sperm competitive ability. And this is surprising because even when we're selecting very strongly for sperm to do better, we see the same type of change in our lab adaptation control. So to me, this indicates that post-insemination dynamics are as important as pre-insemination dynamics, that there is some inherent selection for males to do better in a competitive setting, both for access to mates as well as access to oocytes. So what we wanted to know was, can post-insemination dynamics be manipulated, and can we actually use this in an experimental evolution framework to start to understand the importance of sperm competition? And we are able to design this really cool inducible sterility line so we could actually run this experiment. And we found a very strong response to selection over a sh very short period of time. And these are still new data for me, but mulling them over, I do think that post-insemination interactions are incredibly important and something that we need to start um, explicitly paying more attention to um, in thinking about how male reproductive success is partitioned. So moving forward, I would like to look at the genetic basis of these changes. So we have whole genome sequencing of all of these lines at four time points. So ancestor evolved and two intermediate time points. And those data just got sent back to me yesterday. So I'm very excited to dig in and actually see what the um, responses to selection were. And then we also have done transcriptomics of mated females to get some idea of how females are responding to this increase in kind of male competitive pressures, both pre and post insemination. So with that, I want to thank everyone in the Phillips lab again. Um, I want to thank Butch and Patrick for organizing this organizing this fantastic event and for the opportunity to talk with all of you. Um, my funding sources, and I must have talked fast because I am ahead of schedule, so I can take questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Molly. Do you know what the sperm traits are that um, are associated with your evolved populations? That's a great question. So the question is, do I know what the sperm traits are that are um, uh, correlated with my evolved populations? Um, so I've been doing some work trying to do some imaging to see if sperm size has increased. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of variance in that measure, so that's um, hard to tell. Um, but I'm also trying to see if perhaps sperm position within the spermatheca is also changing. So maybe the evolved sperm is like pushing the competitor sperm out. So those are things I, the two ones that I'm looking at working on right now. Do you think female evolution could be driving some of these patterns? So can the females evolve mm -hmm. in this experimental design? It's a great question. So the question is, could the females also be evolving under this sign, um, design and contributing to what I'm seeing? And definitely the females can evolve, so they're evolving along with the males. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, the way we set up the transcriptomic design, which I'm happy to talk about in detail because it's a little complex, um, but I'm hoping that will actually show me some of the changes on the, the female side um, if they're responding, because um, I, I think they are. But we'll see. Anything else? Go ahead. Can I go again? Um, right. Is there in, in worms, is there, are there any female mediated traits that might be involved in a, like a cryptic choice phenotype that could be co-evolving? Like if your, because because normally C. elegans don't have a lot of sperm competition in the normal hermaphroditic state, they're self-age, right? Yep. Um, and so I'm wondering if by imposing a competitive scenario on these populations, you're actually also imposing female preference 
and female preference can drive the evolution of good genes traits or a good genes phenomena. And I'm wondering if that could explain the increased uh, reproductive success, I guess, yeah. of your, your lab control population. Yeah, so the question is about cryptic female choice, how that might be contributing. Um, we don't know a lot about cryptic female choice in females. In fact, I'd say we know nothing about kind of female response really um, with, within worms. Um, I think it's a really interesting idea. Uh, and I would love to actually chat with you more about how to design an experiment to test that, because um, that could definitely explain why the lab adaptive populations are doing excuse me, doing better, but um, to the best of my knowledge, no one has studied that at all in a worm yet. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.